Everybody's ready to roll. A lot of chatting going on. Good fellowship. I appreciate that. Uh, special welcome to those of you that are meeting us online. Uh, I hope you're well. Everything you need, is, as always, is on the website. Uh, you should have enough sheets on your tables. If you're wandering around out there in the chairs and the back seats, there's extra sheets back over there by Tom and Sandra on the bookshelf. And uh, to grab hold of those, if you'd like them, there's plenty of extras. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to just check, is, is it anybody's birthday today? <laughs> now, she promised me, Mardell promised me, I promised her, that I wouldn't share her age, right? <laughs> so I'll just give you a hint, it's north of 92. Yeah. <laughs> just north, right? So happy birthday, Mardell, what a wonderful celebration, thank you. That is fantastic. All right, so this morning uh, we dive back into the red letters of Jesus, the, the red letters of uh, what he spoke, the words, and so where we camp out mostly in the Gospels and uh, an opportunity to be able to, to do what God has called us to do. That's what makes them radical words. Um, I, I wouldn't argue that if you take them even out of Scripture, some of the things he said were pretty radical. But what truly makes them radical is that he expects us to do them, expects us to follow them, obey them, uh, trust them, uh, and so forth. And, and that's one of the struggles for us is that as churchgoers um, is we tend to get very familiar with them. Oh, I know that, right? And I'm just familiar with it. I remember the first time, uh, it was back in grade school, that I started to, to read um, the Bible in a little bit more detail, and I remember being struck by the story of Noah, right? Up until then, in Sunday school, there was just this beautiful story of all these animals crammed onto a boat, the giraffe's heads are sticking out, and everybody's smiling, they're floating away, until you start to realize this is when Jesus dest or God destroyed life on the planet, other than anything that was swimming and anything that was on the ark. I, it, was, it was a horrific event and yet we kind of created this like oh I've heard it I like it and it's it gentle um, uh, there was a Christian comedian by the name of Tim Hawkins and um, he's still out there and, and traveling doing his thing but he's from Missouri so I kind of liked him when I was in St. Louis followed him and so forth and he talks about that he said those are the pictures that we paint on walls in nurseries Noah's Ark and he said do we really put the whole story there Right, you got this nice, happy little ark and Noah sitting up there and the animals are all smiling. He said, do you have the other people that are dying in torment in the waters? And, you know, all that? no, we kind of, we kind of uh, pacify the stories. Well, we do the same thing uh, with Jesus' words, right? We take the words that he has spoken and we soften them, we water them down and so forth. And yet, if we look at the words, and I think over the next few weeks, Keep this thought in the back of your mind. If we followed these words, right, that Jesus commands us to follow, they're not suggestions, they're not Christianity 2.0, these are the commands of God. I want you just to muse to yourself, what would the world be like if we did them? What would this community be like if we did them? Right, I mean, did the words, not just said, oh, those are good, right? That's that's the least of our concern when it comes uh, to the words of God. Instead, saying to go, those are the words of God. Therefore, what do I do? Uh, what am I going to change? So we are going to look at really the five categories. I've, I've told you that as we look at all the statements of Jesus through the Gospels and Acts, um, as he spoke briefly there in the early portion of the book of Acts, that we can fit most of Jesus' words into these five categories. And so we're going to really investigate each one. So today, we're actually going to do really part two of Jesus' words that invite us to be a part of his family. What does it mean to be in relationship with Jesus? So last week, we touched on the Word of God, his, the Word, Bible, right? We touched on prayer and what it was, and we touched on worship. At the tail end last week, if you happen to have that sheet or looking at it, we touched on meditation, and what that meant. I'm going to pick up on meditation because we didn't have enough time to knock it out last week. So uh, I'd like you to revisit for me, please, Mark 6, 31 uh, in your Bibles or your phones or your tablets, um, or if you happen to have memorized Mark 6, uh, we're going to do verse 31. Somebody have that for us, please. <laughs> And he said to them, 
Come away by yourselves to the desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. Come away by yourself, right? It, it's talking about dial back a little bit. We need to do that. Uh, in fact, I've, I've been kind of surprised that uh, every once in a while you'll come upon uh, an article, right? I, I do a lot of reading, and, and uh, I don't know if that's good or bad because, you know, anybody can write anything, I suppose. But um, I have found that it, there are certain scientists that will publish certain things that will trigger my brain because they line up with what God calls us to do. They're like, you know, you ought to take a break once in a while from the chaos of life. Most scientists, you know, experts, doctors would say, that's a good idea, right? And you're like, yeah, you didn't come up with that, right? That was actually God, right? Day seven of creation, he rested. You know why he rested? Not because he was tired, right? He rested because it's a good idea, okay? And, and so as we see that, we're kind of like going, okay, now it's not just rest for the body, right? Sometimes it's rest for the brain, it's rest for the, the spirit and things like that. But there's a, there's a spiritual point to it too. But as we see it, but we're going to really just say it's about meditate. So jot that down again. This is where we ended off last week. And it's why there's a letter D up there and not an A at the beginning like we're just starting something new. We're continuing where we were last week. We covered A, B, C, and D. This is D continued so that you just don't think that pastor doesn't know his alphabet. I would just tell you it's Greek and you'd believe me and we'd move on. Right? All right. So here's the question to continue on with this idea of meditate. How do you spend your time? Now, I underline the word spend because I don't want to just take the phrase of, hey, how do you spend your time? I mean, from a sense of currency, how do you spend your time? What are you doing with your time? See, because what I mentioned last week uh, uh, on this, when we talked about meditate, is a survey was done, and I, I think it was... Um, now I'm forgetting what the percentage was. I want to say it was 60% of the people said they were just too busy to come into the relationship with God, right? To, to expend daily relational time with God uh, through prayer, through worship, through reading the word and so forth. So the question is, so how do we spend our time? One of the things I think we could all agree on is that it feels as though now our lives are busier than they used to be. Now, when I say busier, I don't necessarily mean busier with one thing. I think what we're trying to do many times in our culture, we try to multitask, right? And, and you know, weekends are filled with different things in school and after school and, and things, vacations. Um, you know, when I went on vacation, I used to go to vacation and try to do nothing. Now, sometimes people go on vacation and they just fill it with everything, right? They're just, I'm going to keep busy the whole time. You're like, I could do that at home, Right. Now, now, sometimes it's about doing different things you don't get a chance to do at home. I get that. But the point is, is how are we spending the time that we have? I've, I've shared with you before as a pastor. Um, I think of this quite a bit when I think of, of my role as a, as a shepherd of a, of a flock, is that I don't know how much time I have. I'm not trying to be morbid, right? But I don't know. I, I know that all of us have a finite amount of time on this planet, and how we spend it is important, right? I, I don't want to one day um, sit down on a porch on a rocking chair sometime and regret how I spent my time, right? And I don't mean that just in a purely earthly, fleshy way. I mean, I, I want to sit back and kind of go, man, I'm tuckered out, right? I'm tuckered out because we did things. We've done things and, and so we're meaningful things, fruitful things. So when we think about how do we spend our time, I want you to think of what do you do with your time? Not the activities, but what are you spending? What kind of equity, what kind of currency are we using? Let's keep going. So what happens if we consider this? What happens to earthly relationships when we struggle here? I want you to think about that. So if you have a, a significant other, right? Spouse, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever the case may be. Uh, or you have family members, <laughs> siblings, um, children, things like that, or just dear friends. What happens when you spend your time in other pursuits than with that relationship? What happens to the relationship? It struggles. It starts to fall away, right? If, if we say, you know, I haven't sat down. I was, I was talking to somebody just this morning. I was sharing something with a fam, about a family member to them. And this person said, boy, I'm, I'm glad you had a chance to talk with them. I haven't talked with them in weeks, right? And, and, and we can see that there are times that you and I feel that strain. 
right? Now, some of it is distance and geography and things like that, but what about the people that are in the same house as you, right? You know that there is difficulty if we're like, I just don't take the time. I'm spending it in other ways. We have a, we have a, a bunch of weddings coming up here in the spring uh, here at Faith, and so it's an interesting opportunity for me to sit down with the couples. I do premarital counseling with them, so uh, I got to keep a lot of notes because I got to keep track of what I said to one couple and what I said to the other couple, right? And uh, so I get my notepad out and I, I write things down. And one of the things I, I appreciate is is talking to them about their families, where they came from. Tell me about what you grew up with. Tell me about your siblings, your parents, and, and your experiences, and so forth. And what I find is that there are relationships that are changing, right? When you get married, your relationship with your parents changes, right? I tell them that. Um, and for those of you that are married, I want you to know your top priority in this life is your spouse, period. It's not your children. It's not your parents. It's not your brothers and sisters. It's your spouse, period. And, and that's, that's beyond discussion. That's, that's where all your strength comes from. That's what God built in that. That's why he said, and the two become one flesh. He doesn't say that about kids. He doesn't say it about parents and kids. Um, he says it about husband and wife. That's the unique mystery. And he says, that's the point. So when you and I spend our currency of time apart from those relationships, those relationships suffer. And they're not meant to. Most of the time, um, when there are difficulties in a relationship, the first thing I talk about is time. What do you do together? How do you spend time? Well, we're in the same house in the evening. Okay, well, that's, you know, that, that's not really the point, right? Well, you know, he goes and does this, and I go and do this, and so forth. I said, well, what time do you spend together? The currency, okay? And, and, uh, and so with God, let's blow it up into this, this more relevant when we talk about being with Jesus. What do we spend time each day building this relationship or kind of neglecting it, okay? So let's keep going. God's word is the antidote to worry. This is a great idea. One of the things I found throughout the pandemic uh, was worry. There was a great deal of worry through the pandemic. Uh, some of it based very truly on issues. Some things were blown out of proportion at times. Um, like everything. I, I've heard people even talking about the, the conflict in, with Russia and the Ukraine. There's people that are like going, somebody's going to push the button. There's going to be nuclear war. And, and you're kind of like going, oh, easy. Okay. That, that's that's not worth worrying about. God says in the Bible, right, worrying doesn't do any good, okay? But I'm telling you, meditation, right, is the antidote. Spending time with the Word of God is the antidote to the problem of worry, okay? There's nothing wrong with being vigilant, and I'm not just playing semantics here with words. There's nothing wrong with being uh, uh, obedient. There's nothing wrong with, with being, um, uh, you know, focused on the details. But to worry and fret draws away from your confidence and faith in God. And so if, if you feel the, the anxiety start to well up and that fear and that concern and it becomes irrational, right? Like for me to lay in bed and worry about being bit by a dog would be irrational, okay? Now we own a dog, so I'm pretty much assuming that that dog's not going to bite me. But I was like, well, what if a dog breaks in the house and it's rabid and it comes and bites me in my sleep? That's silly right, to worry about that. Or if I lay there in bed and just kind of go, boy, if I ever get cancer, that would be awful. And I just sit there and fret and agonize over you, like, can you do anything to stop it right now? And go ahead and do those things. But just to sit and worry about it is pointless. So what you do is you find out, I'm going to spend some time, intentional time, focusing on God. One of the ways is through his work, right, through prayer. Um, one of the things I find, your pastor does not sleep through the night. I just don't. Um, a lot of times it's your fault. <laughs> most of the time most of the time you worry. yeah I, no i don't worry no that's that's exactly wrong no uh and, and a lot of times what it does and i'll tell you you all get prayed for a lot you really do and, and because that's just what i do when i'm awake and and one of you is on my mind maybe it's intentional because something's going on in your life or i just happen to think about you or whatever then you get prayed for and you get prayed for until i get tired Right, which sometimes it's a long time. So if uh, um, if you woke up this morning and had a really good start to your day, you're welcome. <laughs> All right. But the point is, is that's the way to deal with. I could sit there and worry. I could worry about our church. I could worry about our call. Right. I could sit there and go, oh no, it means this and this and this, and you start to reel and just kind of spin off into this. Or you can kind of go, well, God, what's next? What are you going to do with this? 
right? Instead, we could just sit there and just spin our wheels and, and be in conflict with ourselves and so forth. And God kind of goes, hey, here's an idea. Trust me. Here's an idea. I'm in charge, right? In fact, you can say you are and worry about it all you want. It doesn't change anything at all, right? Except make me suffer and make you suffer and so forth. So we see this. Um, ladies, would you look up John 8, 31, 32, and gentlemen, Joshua 1, 8, just to get some perspective on the word of God on this. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's one of those great statements. We often kind of go, free, yes. Free from what? Right? The truth will set you free. Here's the truth, right? That God loves us, that God has got things under control. It's going to unfold exactly the way that God knows it's going to unfold. Do you ever think about that? That God knows how everything is going to happen? And yet we still pray for him to change things. Right? Now, there's nothing wrong with asking that because you and I don't know how things are going to unfold. So it's fine to ask him. But he already knows how it's going to happen, which is wonderful because then he can tell you or work in you to prepare you for the end result. Right? My, my wife and I, a um, long time ago, we watched Braveheart. Mel Gibson, Braveheart. This is back when it was on uh, VHS. Now, if you've ever watched Braveheart, it is a marathon movie. It's a long movie, I think two and a half, three hours, something like that. So it comes in two VHS tapes. You see where this story's going. Get a pizza, sit down in the living room when it first came out, and I pop the tape in, we start watching it. It jumps right into a battle. And I'm like, whoa, this really gets into the storyline really quick. And Mel Gibson's character gets captured, and he's tied down, and he's looks like he's going to be killed on this stage in front of all the kings and things like that, and all his men are in the crowd kind of in disguise and so forth, and he yells, freedom, and they kill him. And I'm like, what a lame movie. We're only 30 minutes into this movie, and Mel Gibson's dead already. We put the wrong tape in first. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. Yeah, Chris is back there kind of going, we did. She's very gracious, right? But here's the funny thing. Then we, we kind of laughed about it. We kind of pulled it out. We're like, oh, this is tape two. I probably should have seen that big number two on it. I put tape one in. We sit down to watch it. It was so different watching the movie, knowing how it's going to end. He falls in love with this girl. He starts building up his army. I'm like, he's going to die, right? Going to go up against this king. And you're like, yeah, you're going to win. Nope, you're going to die. I already saw it. But see, it changes how we see things. So God knows how our story is going to continue and ultimately how it's going to conclude. So talk to the one who knows, right? That's the freedom from worry. You don't have to worry because you don't know how it ends. But the king, right, uh, the, the king of all, the master of the universe, he does know how it ends. And so that just, just eliminates that fear and that worry. Um, gentlemen, John Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you will be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosper, and then you will have good success. Now, when it talks about, there's a clue in there, it says meditate day and night. What that's referring to is a continual act of meditating. And what that would have meant in the church would be fasting. Right? And, and actually taking time to kind of deal with that uh, issue. And that's kind of going to lead us into the next discussion. Uh, 1 Timothy 4.8. Fasting means to abstain from something that is important to you. We often think of food. right? Fasting is, is a, you know, limiting or eliminating food for a time. Okay? Uh, would you all look up 1 Timothy 4.8, please? For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So bodily training, he says, if you take care of your body, that's good, right? It is the temple of God. But what he goes on and says, he says, I want you to take it another step further. Include the spiritual, right? That spiritual guidance that also can take place. It's really, that, that really ought to be the best motivation that we have to take care of ourselves, right? To take care of yourself because God has given you this body. Uh, because on the last day, he's going to ask for it back, right? He's going to kind of go, what'd you do with it, right? And if you show up and kind of go, here it is, <laughs> right? He's going to kind of go, that was a gift, 
I gave that to you, right? Um, I've shared this story with you guys before when I was a teacher in high school. Uh, I rode a motorcycle. I've always ridden a motorcycle. And we had chapel. I, I taught in a Christian high school. And um, one of my chapels that I was up in front of the students, 650 of them or so, and um, I gave uh, one of the students my, my motorcycle key, and I told him for the sake of the uh, message that I was going to give you my motorcycle for the rest of the school year. And I said, I want you to take care of it. At the end of the year, I'm going to ask for it back. And, uh, and I, so I asked him, I said, so what are you going to do with my, with my bike? He says, I'm going to park it in the garage under a sheet and leave it alone. And I said, that's not the deal. It's to be ridden. That's what its purpose is and so forth. And I said, so what are you going to do? I'm going to take really good care of it. And I'm like, well, why? He said, you'd kill me if anything happened to your bike. <laughs> not really what I was going for. But I said, yeah, so there's some judgment. There's some consequences if you don't. But I said, your intention of how you treat that possession is because it belongs to me. And I said, that's how I want us to take care of our human bodies. Right? They are a gift from God, and we should honor that. But it's not just physically. Eat well, get exercise, and get enough sleep. That's not all it is. That's part of it. So I also want it to be something that's going to improve our spirituality, our connection to God. So what you do with your body is a response to Him, not something that is egotistical and vain. Right? If you want to lose weight and get healthy so you look good, it's the wrong reason. If you want to take care of yourself because the body belongs to God and you have it on loan, that's a good thing, right? So that's what God is ultimately saying. He says, so if fasting, which is relieving yourself of important things. So um, this is a good probably reference to make um, at Lent. I'm not going to ask you to tell me what you've given up for Lent, if anything. That's the reason people abstain from things at Lent. It's about this coming in contact with God, having a deeper understanding, an appreciation of Christ's suffering. But I have people that kind of say, well, I'm going to give up uh, helping with dishes uh, for Lent. Uh, that's actually important to keep doing, not something to give up. I had somebody tell me this year, and we got talking about it, and they said, I said, well, what are you going to give up? He said, I'm going to give up the big bucket of popcorn at the movies. And I'm like, Probably should have done that before Lent, right? That's not good for you. So giving up something not good for you. Now, if you're going to, I had somebody tell me this, and this would be a good one, by the way. I'm going to give up Facebook for 40 days. Good for you. Somebody once told me this. This was bizarre. I'm going to give up cell phones for 40 days. And I'm like, for life, I think I would like to sometimes, right? Or I'm going to give it. These are things that we have, they have become very important to us. Now, as you struggle without them, the focus is, is like, Recognize that Christ has suffered for you, not in the same ways. Jesus didn't come to earth and give up Facebook, okay? Came up to give up his life and give up his, his throne and give up his role in relationship with his father for a time. But when we suffer, then it just brings us into mindfulness of what Christ has given up for a moment. We just kind of go, oh, man, I am really hungry, okay? And they're like, oh, I'm supposed to remember that Christ gave up things for me. What are those things? And it's just a trigger. That's all it is. But it is a way for us to come into the presence of God. In fact, scientists have learned when you and I fast, our brains work differently, right? Because you are not so busy with digestion. I shared this morning the importance of water and uh, how we need water for digestion and so forth. Um, when your body is digesting food, it, it takes effort and it takes focus off of other places in your body. Uh, when it's cold outside, like this morning, Right? I looked at the weather and I'm like, oh, it's going to be a beautiful day. And I walked outside, it's cold, right? So it's one of those days you wear a coat here and then you carry it out to the car afterwards. The point is, is that when you go out and it's cold, your body kind of says, you know, hands and toes, not priorities. You're going to keep your core warm. So what happens? Your hands and feet get cold. That's just different focus, right? Your body kind of goes, hey, there's some priorities. When you're digesting food, your body kind of goes, here's the greatest priority. We've got to take care of this right here. So all the stuff that's happening up here, I'm going to dial that back a little bit. You're not going to be able to think as deeply um, and as intimately as you could. So when we get rid of other things that pull our body's resources and their attention, this suddenly has the opportunity to think. I shared with you last week, somebody came and shared a great story with me about it too. Um, I often pray in the shower. Right? That's, that's where my mind works the best because I, I don't have to think about much else. Rinse, wash, repeat. I don't have to do that. Right? That was a hair joke for those of you that didn't get that. <laughs> I'm losing my touch. Um, the point is, is that there are times and places in your day that there are able times that you can think. 
And fasting is one of the ways that physiologically your body has the openness, the availability to think differently, think deeper, think a little bit more vast. Uh, and that's important for us. In fact, I can tell you that fasting is probably the most foreign means of coming into God's presence. We just don't do it very often. And yet it's mentioned in the Bible multiple times. God even challenges us, you know, do this through prayer and fasting, right? Do it. I've, I've done it when it's time to, to, uh, to create a new sermon series. Sometimes I'll take a day or two and I'm just like, I'm going to fast. And just for a time to sit in my office. And so while I'm hungry, you have to kind of deal with the hunger pains. But you sit there and kind of go, but I'm trying to, to, to let my brain go deeper or further into places that I'm not so distracted by things. Sometimes fasting means leaving a place, right? Stepping out of the office and go outside where things quiet down a little bit for me, okay? Uh, or go for a ride or go for a hot hike or something like that. But finding a way to where I can fast from some of the things around us. It is a valuable tool to come into the presence of God. We should take advantage of it more often. It reminds you, when you recognize that I want something, it should remind us of our dependence on God, right? I am dependent on food. And so when I have a desire for it, then just let that be a trigger and go, I should have a desire for God the same way that I want bread or food, you know, or something, right? Uh, people have said, well, I'm going to give up chocolate for Lent, or I'm going to give up alcohol, or I'm going to, you know, something like that, something that is a regular habit for you. Go ahead and do that. Let it be something that when you want it, it's a trigger to say, I need to depend on God even more so than I think I depend on chocolate or alcohol or Facebook and things like that. All right. Um, reminds us of how much God provides for you, right? It does. It, it reminds you that all these things that you could have but aren't having right now, one of the many blessings that God gives, right? You want to try something interesting during Lent, uh, during the rest of this Lent, is uh, wake up every morning and just start thanking God for the things that you can think of. Thank Him for what you can think of. And uh, unfortunately, you'll be late to work most days. <laughs> right? Because there are a great many things that will just be brought to your mind like, oh yeah, there's this. Simple things. Complicated, great things. Okay. Um, I always laughed when, we, when I was growing up, we used to, uh, at Thanksgiving, kind of a tradition, a lot of families, I think, go around the table and say, this is what I'm thankful for. And we'd list off things. It was always fun um, because my littler brothers and sister and stuff, the things they were thankful for were just different. I'm thankful for G.I. Joe and I'm thankful for my Holly Hobby doll and, and so forth. And then mom would come around and she'd have this wonderful thing. I'm thankful for my children, the love that we have. And then we all go, yeah. Uh, ditto for that. Uh, forget my bike that I listed a minute ago, you know. And, and yet we all have these things that we can be and should be thankful for. And the list just goes on and on and on. But it makes us mindful of what God has provided for us. Ultimately, what I want you to understand, when God gives good gifts, the reason he gives those good gifts is not just because he's good. That's true. God is good. I'm not questioning that or, or posing that as a possibility. But the reason that he gives good gifts is so that you will come to know him better than before. When, when as a parent, I give my kids gifts, Christmas, birthday, sometimes just for random things, it's meant to show my love for them, not just so that you have this, a thing. That's too limiting. Instead, I, I said, I, I want you to know love, and, and here's a symbol of it. And not that gifts are the prerequisite for it, but it was just one of those things. The whole point of a gift is something you don't deserve. And, and so what God wants, he says, I want your heart. Here's why. Because you and I are going to end up with him one day because of it. You're not going to be with God one day because you were good, uh, because you were obedient, which we can't be, um, or anything else. You're going to be in heaven one day because God will win over your heart. That's what faith is. He wins it over and says, do you trust me? Do you believe in me? Do you depend on me? That's your heart. That's what I want. That's why when he says a tithe in, in church, um, a tithe is a tenth. A tenth of what we have, um, that's what he says to give to me. Does he really care about the amount? Not in the least. He gives a tenth, he, he states a tenth because he goes, you need it. You need a gauge. I, I want to tell you, based on God's word, the tithe is where we start, not our goal. Tithe is just the expectation. Most of us kind of live life through it and just kind of go, one of these days, I'm going to get to the tithe. I'm going to get to that tenth. And God goes, actually, that's where I want you to start. 
right? Because he knows it stings. He knows it'll stretch us. And he goes, that's what I want, right? Why do I want that? Because I want your heart. I want you to trust me. Trust is not this. Plink. That's not trust. That's just kind of obedience, I guess, in kind of a, a warped sense. Instead, God says, you know what? I want your heart. And you know what? It'll demonstrate that is if you stretch yourself, if you extend yourself, if you're generous and sacrificial. So um, a tithe. Let's start there and go from there. Grow from there. Instead, we kind of go, well, what do I have to do? That's not your heart, right? That's a mind. That's just being obedient in some kind of, like I said, warped sort of way. Um, make Jesus your primary want. That's the goal of fasting, to make Jesus our primary desire, right? So when somebody says, what do you want in this world? The answer is Jesus. It sounds like a confirmation question because the answer is always Jesus in confirmation, right? What do you want in this life? I know we could rattle off a whole bunch of things, but you know what the right answer is all the time? It's Jesus. That's what our primary want ought to be because if you want Jesus, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and everything else, this is the ESV version, the Eric Standard version, everything else will fall into place. Because God says, when you want me, everything else just fits. Not perfectly because we're sinful, I get that. But the fact is, is that we roll into this life and we just get distracted by a great many things and Jesus goes, I'm it. I've told you many, many, many times, Jesus is not to be number one in our life. He's meant to be only. Because if he's number one, then you're dividing up the pie in all different ways without him being involved. Instead, if he is the pie, then everything gets cut up within that relationship. My family relationship, because of Jesus. My relationship with my church, because of Jesus. My relationship with my neighbors and my community, because of Jesus. I don't take Jesus out of any of it, right? He's the one that I pursue and everything else falls into place. And that's what causes me to be invited into that relationship with him. All right. Um, we don't do it for recognition. Don't fast so that people see it or hear about it. That's why a lot of times I kind of shy away from anyone who comes up and kind of goes, hey, pastor, what are you giving up for Lent? Because I don't really think most people when they ask that question are really asking out of brotherly or sisterly love. They're ranking it, right? They, they want to know whether or not I'm better than them, right? You're giving up that? Oof. Yeah. And, and then that's the end of the conversation. Or if they think they've beaten me, then they share Right? Oh, yeah? <laughs> right? It's kind of like when you tell somebody that you had two wisdom teeth taken out, right? That they step up and kind of go, I had four taken out. Right? That's that they up your story all the time. Same thing with, with uh, those things. Uh, Matthew 6, 17. Matthew 6, 17. But when you fast and wash your head and wash your face. Keep going. <laughs> okay. That your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Thank you, Dean. Sorry about that. So I want you to know one of the things that, um, that happened uh, back in the day is that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, uh, they used to practice this because, see, fasting is a, is a dictate in the Old Testament. And in the Pharisees, teachers of the law, they made many of the laws... Um, Different, uh, And what I mean different is they were requirements, not guidelines to, to shape your relationship with God. See, we want to obey God because what he's done for us, not because it grants us access to God. See, they changed it from if you do these things, you get access to God. The Bible teaches us because of Jesus, we have access to God. Now, what do you want to do? So obedience is, I want to follow, obey the commandments. I want to do the things he's called me to do. Why? Because he loves me so much. Not, I have to do these things so that he'll love me so much. It's just, it's backwards, right? So when people say, do you have to do anything to be a believer? The answer is no. You don't have to do anything. It's been done for us. That's what Jesus has done. And that's why we struggle with it because we kind of take that as an easy way out. Well, if Jesus has already done it and he's going to forgive me for no matter what I do, I can just kind of coast, can I? See, those are the times that we kind of are like that parable of the, of the man that is brought in front of the king and the king says, man, you owe me several million dollars. Pay up. Um, I don't have it. And he's like, I'm going to throw you in jail. I'm going to throw your family in jail. We're going to sell you all into slavery so I can recoup some of my money. And he begs, please forgive me. I'll pay you back, whatever it takes. 
And he has compassion on him. He says, no, nah, don't worry about it. I'll just forgive the debt. Forgives it completely. Family's not going to prison. They're not being sold into slavery. He's free to go. Walks out of the throne room, and what does he run into? Somewhere. Somebody who owes him 20 bucks. Where's my 20? All right, maybe a little bit more than that. And, uh, and the guy goes, I, I don't have it, but I'll pay you. I promise. Same words that he just spoke in front of the king. And he goes, not good enough. You know the law. If you can't pay your debts in the jail, you go and you got to work it off. It has him thrown into jail. Now, what Jesus' point is, is was that man, when he left the king, was he forgiven? Yes and no. In the eyes of the king, he was forgiven. But in his eyes, I don't think he was. Because he didn't understand it. He didn't get what forgiveness was. When you and I come to understand what God has done for us, it changes us, right? When you understand that you and I are doomed to hell in eternity apart from God, but because of grace, Jesus alone, nothing that you and I do, you have been offered the invitation to go to heaven. Now, how do you want to live? Do you want to live like this? Eh, right? I don't really care too much about what God says. Or are you buckled at the knees kind of going, I, I can't give you enough. I can't spend enough time in your presence. Um, to be able to change this world around me for your sake. Um, making fasting private, the, the uh, Pharisees, as I was getting on about, um, they would often uh, wear makeup. And, uh, and what I mean by makeup is they'd make their faces look more gaunt so they look like they were really suffering. I've gone three days without food. Look how pathetic I look. And so people would look at them and they would kind of go, wow, you're really spiritual. Right? And that's the reason. They were just kind of going, look at me, I'm fasting. Right? I don't know if they actually did that. That would be kind of weird. <laughs> the point is, is that that's when somebody will tell you, it's like, hey, what are you giving up for Lent? Guess what I'm giving up? Right? That's a lot of times when I'll just do this. They're like, what are you doing? Nothing. <laughs> just making a point. Okay? The point is, is it's to be done in private. Because who's it between? You and God. That's all it is. And, and so he says, tell you what, and that's why Jesus says, wash your face. He says, get rid of whatever you're trying to make it look a certain way. Keep on with life. Keep going. The fasting, the, the separation between you and God is, is being uh, tensed, as it were. All right, let's keep going. Letter F, backside. Luke 15, 23. Someone, please. I love this one. And bring the fat and calf and kill it. And let it eat and celebrate. Bring the fattened calf and kill it and let's eat. Here's what it's about. We Lutherans love this. Eating and celebrating. Now, this is something we can get behind, right? Now, I, I want you to know, there is power in food. I don't mean nutritional food. Uh, obviously, there's energy in there. I'm telling you, there is power when we come together for food. Um, one of the things I, we kind of joked about, I think it was uh, when we were out at Gary and Holly's with, uh, with Pastor Martin, and we were talking because we all brought food. You know, there's all people sharing food to, to get all the, the leadership, the call committee together to meet pastor and so forth. And um, so people started joking a little bit because he's, he's a pastor out in a parish in, in Virginia. And they're like, so when you get together as your church, um, what color is the jello and the fruit that's inside? Right? Because that's kind of one of these standard Lutheran, you know, gathered. And what kind of casseroles are popular? out in Virginia, because casseroles are very popular when Lutherans get together. Some of you know this, right? As we grow up in certain denominational boundaries, there's certain things, foods, that we participate in. Now, if you can go way back, and if you have a German heritage, right, um, there are certain German dishes that you're like, oh yeah, when you get together, this is a given. You have to have this. Now, if you come from other ethnic groups, there, there are certain indigenous foods as well that we think of. But God invites us to enjoy and fellowship with food. It's one of the things that gathers us together. When Jesus went to go to people's houses, what did he often do? He'd eat. And it wasn't just kind of like, I like to kill two birds with one stone. As long as I'm going to sit here and teach you and socialize with you, it'd really be great if we had some food. Mary and Martha, what was Martha so worried about? Food, right? Jesus is here. What do we have to do? Got to feed them, right? I remember, this doesn't happen as often anymore. You know when somebody knocks on your door today, right, in the evening? We don't behave the same way we used to. Like, I remember growing up when somebody would, you know, the doorbell would ring. My mom would go, oh, someone's here. And she'd go to the door and swing wide open and welcome. Come on in for some coffee. I'll put some coffee on some Sanka, right? We'll have some coffee. 
and I got some little Entenmann cakes. I'll get those out of the fridge and we'll have it sit down. Tell us what's going on. You know, this gathering. It's this, right? Now when the bell rings and it's evening, what do we do? Hit the lights, start doing the crawl across the... Right? Just be quiet. They won't see us and then they'll go away. Right? We don't like people on our front stoop anymore, right? We've kind of lost some of that, but the church still wants to do this. We still want to get together. Most believe Christianity is a life full of restraint. And, and it isn't. It, it, is, it has never been about restraint other than restraint from sinning. But, but that's such a small aspect of what Christianity is meant to be. Right? I mean, you think about how much enjoyment we have when we laugh in here or when we have a meal together, right? Lenten meals are going on. If you haven't come to a Wednesday meal, please come and join us. Um, that's the reason we have the meal, right? Not because we're like, you know what this church needs? Sloppy Joes, <laughs> right? Or we need some goulash. We haven't had some good goulash for a while, right? Uh, and so forth. Now, those are wonderful things, but you know what we need? Is we need this. We need fellowship, right? We need God's people getting together. Do you know why for holidays we get family together? Because that's what we want to do. We need that. And, and we usually put food with that because it's really good. It's one of the reasons we get together. When you go to a party, a gathering of people that you kind of prefer to be there, you know how awkward it is if you have nothing to eat or drink? You know how weird that would be just stand around in a big crowded room kind of going, how's it going? <laughs> yeah, good. How are you doing? <laughs> Still doing well? <laughs> Excellent. You know? I mean, just, just to have something to hold or something to be nibbling on, we just kind of go, boy, this is really fun. Right? I can just sit here and just, I'm eating Cheetos and enjoying myself. I don't even like Cheetos. Right? You're like, that's un American, Pastor. <laughs> John 10 10, you don't have to look it up, but it talks about God says, He's, I'm going to promise you that they may have life and have it to the full. God wants us to have a full life in this, not full by your definition, but full by God's. And that is to come into his presence and enjoy the very presence of God among his people. He has wired us to be social, right? I, I, I'm not concerned with the test you've taken online that says, oh, I'm an extrovert or an introvert. God has created you to be part of a community. He's built us that way. You are not the total package. I mean that from a spiritual standpoint. You are an eye or a foot or an ear or an elbow or maybe somebody in here is even a spleen, right? <laughs> the point is we are meant to all come together as the body. And when the body is missing a part, we all feel it, right? We're missing something. So we want to be together. There's a benefit and a blessing to being together. All right. We Christians should attract people by joy and the fun of being believers. Do you know why people end up coming back to faith? You know what they usually say? You guys know this. Some of you have even said it to me. What do people love about faith when they come here? Friendly. It's friendly. That's what they claim is true about here. Now, it's not always true. Okay, that's not me being critical. That's just me being honest, right? There's times that people have a bad feeling and have a bad experience, but... That should be the norm. When you come in here, right? You remember the old children's song, if you're happy and you know it, right? And then there's later on in the verse, if you're happy and you know it, then your face should surely show it, right? I, I've said this before. When we come away from the Lord's Supper, you know what I don't want to see? This. <laughs> Just received the very grace of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of all my sins. It was awesome. Really excited about a brand new person. Washed, forgiven. Can't wait till you go up there. So you can have this right there. We should go and we should have a smile just ear to ear and just be able to kind of go, I just I just got it right up there. Grace. I didn't deserve it. I got it, delivered it to me, and I'm forgiven and I'm a brand new person. Man, if my body could do it, I'd do cartwheels. Right? But I'm happy, right? That joy. Sometimes we come away from church and we feel about as melancholy as, you know, as somebody took our puppy, right? It shouldn't be our reaction. We should come away from church so that other people see and kind of go, what have you got? I want it. I want what you have, right? Are you ever attracted to someone else's passion if they are depressed about it? Right? If somebody came up to you and kind of go, would you like to go fishing sometime? Oh, yeah, really? Do you love going? I hate it. 
<laughs> I never catch anything. I'm an awful fisherman. I complain the whole time I'm there. I don't like talking to people, but would you like to go? <laughs> nope. 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 I've, I've said and talked with Tom uh, about the Cubs on occasion, right? And he'll tell me about them, how much he loves them, and things like that. I would go to a game with Tom, right? I would, all right, because he loves it, and it shows, right? You and I, we should come away from church having that same joy and that same excitement. And so when people see you at work and kind of go, man, what is in you? What's the answer? Jesus, Jesus right? I had church this Sunday. It was awesome, right? There were people, and there was singing and all this great stuff, and they, you, you know what? You should come. Right? It was awesome. Instead of this kind of, you should come to our church. It's great. We sing. Songs are wonderful. Pastor. Gifted. Right? Why would you go there? Right? All right, let's finish it up. Sorry, I'm kind of getting off track here. In Christ, we have hope. And we have joy and we have peace. That's where our joy is. If you come away from church and say, I am not happy, I, I apologize because you did not meet Christ in worship. Because if you meet Christ in worship and you understand more about him, you got to smile. you got to have a little bounce in your step. It doesn't mean that all life is suddenly good. I get that. We're all struggling with different things in life. But when you come into the presence of God, I've had people, you know, come out kind of, I didn't like that hymn, Right? I get that, right? Now, you can keep that to yourself because I want you to know that hymn sung about Jesus. So that makes it a good hymn, right? And the Bible verse that we read, it has to do with God. That's good, even though it was hard for you to hear or hard for you to understand, right? We still have that sense that if in Christ is our hope and our joy, there is no reason to be downcast. There, there's no reason to be depressed about Pastor Martin declining the call. No reason to even think that way because Christ is our hope. And so what do we do? We go, God, you've got a plan. And, and we'll, we'll depend on that. Are there times that we have to lean into that a little bit more? Most of the time, yes. But he's our hope. It's not in the things of this world, the trappings of this life. Let's finish it up. Um, uh, let me just keep going. You can look that up. Do you have a reason to celebrate? That's, that's really my question as we look at this. Do you have a reason to to celebrate when you come to church. Now, I'm not asking for a yes or no because I, I hope that you know that when you come in here, and it doesn't even have to do with being in here. We just happen to love being together, right? This is one of the best ways to come together and celebrate when we bring the church together. But since this is halftime, we're supposed to obviously continue it on and we go out, okay? But we see that importance that we recognize that. Cliff, question? Uh, question. Oh, oh, did I miss one? Too many times we make this life look boring, more boring than abundant. Sorry, I didn't even make a slide for it. I didn't even see it. Sorry. Too many times, so it's that one dot up there, third one. Too many times we make this life look more boring than abundant, that life to the full. Thank you. Right? You're like me. If I left a blank and left the class, I just wouldn't be able to sleep tonight. <laughs> so let's talk about this real quick. I know I'm over time. Um, the last thing that God calls us to do and, and to participate in is a Sabbath. It's a Hebrew word that means rest. Not just physical rest, mind rest, spirit rest, um, activity rest, things like that. Um, God rested on the seventh day because what he made was worth enjoying. That's a good way to look at it. He didn't rest because he was tired. He did rest to set a model for us. That's true. Because obviously God doesn't need to rest. But I really believe that as he stepped away from what he had made in creation, he says, this is beautiful. And he stepped back and looked at it. Um, one of the things I'm looking forward to, and this is going to be weird, uh, but I think some of you can identify this. When I get done mowing the lawn that's coming, right, I stop and I look at it. Right now, sometimes I just wait for my wife to come out and look at it. Right? <laughs> right? Appreciate me, right? But instead, I look at it. You know what I do? I just kind of go, "That looks good." It's a little prideful. I get it, right? But the point is, I'm proud of it, right? And then my sitting back and just kind of, <sighs> that was tiring, but man, that looks good. I think that's what God does. 
And he steps back and he goes, take a Sabbath, take a break, and look at what God did, because what does it focus on? God. It right? doesn't focus on my lawn. That's not really my point, is to be able to kind of go, what a great lawnmower I am. No, actually, I'm not that good. But the point is, I look at it and I go, like, I'm proud of what, it, what I've done. I think God was proud of, in a right way, of what he had done. Um, the Pharisees, teachers of the law, have added, uh, had added in Jesus' time a great deal to God's gift of the Sabbath, right? They said in order to follow the Sabbath, you have to follow all these rules. There are certain things you couldn't do. When the man came up to Jesus and what's the most important rule to follow, that's what they were referring to, all the rules. Like a woman in Jesus' time, a woman could not carry a needle and thread on the Sabbath because she might be tempted to sew, and that's work. Right? You cannot spill water out of a basin on the Sabbath because as it hits the ground, it inadvertently washes that portion of the floor. And that's work. If you walk through a field, Jesus' disciples got in trouble for this, cannot pick grain and pop them into your mouth because that right there is work. And they said, no, the Sabbath, it's against God's law to work. And that's why Jesus many times healed on the Sabbath because he was making a point. Right? He said, listen, the Sabbath is for me. It's about you focusing on God. It is not about jumping through hoops and following certain legality to it uh, and so forth. And so they had perverted it so badly. So he wanted to clean that up. Now we read it and, uh, and it, it says, do this in your heart and so forth. And, and you and I kind of respond, just tell us what to do. That's what, that's what religion ought to be reduced to. Just tell me what rules to follow and what I have to do. I'm here to tell you, God doesn't do that. He says, what I want is your heart. So everything we've talked about, those things, those basically those eight, nine things uh, that Jesus says in his words, that he says, I want your heart. That's how it boils down. I want to have a deeper, abiding relationship with you. And so my prayer for all of us uh, as we come together as church is that we lean in to that relationship with God. He has given us so many ways through word, through worship, through meditation, through fasting, uh, through eating and celebrating, through the Sabbath. Those are all ways to be mindful, be reminded of God. Use those things. It is a shame to wrestle with your relationship with God and not take advantage of what he's created in us to do. Right? Again, it's like standing in your kitchen that's full of food and go, I'm starving to death. That's just silly to say, but it's right here. You can access it. It's there. To have this relationship with God and say, I just feel parched and dry. I'm drying from my sermon this morning. And yet God says, I'm right here. The stream of living water, all you got to do is just reach out. It's available. All right, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love, your mercy. Um, Lord, I thank you for timing of how you deliver messages to us in a time and in a way that is helpful for us where we are and where we're struggling. Lord, I pray, fill us up. Uh, with your presence, right? All through these ways that you have invited us uh, to, to be involved with you, whether it's reading your word, talking with you in prayer, worshiping your name, all the ways that we can come into your presence. Help us take advantage of it. Grow us, challenge us. Lord, most importantly, fill us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.